It is rivalry week in the Pacific Northwest. Much earlier than typical, you will not be eating your Thanksgiving leftovers, watching the Apple Cup or the Civil War, as this Saturday, September 14th, will be the Apple Cup and the Civil War. The stakes are high for all four teams this year as every team heading into week three are undefeated. And after this weekend, the Huskies and Ducks will begin their Big Ten conference schedule and the Cougars and Beavers will begin their largely Mountain West remainder of schedule. For all four teams, this is an especially high stakes rivalry game as every team is currently undefeated. The Huskies and Ducks are looking to remain undefeated and give them the best shot at making the college football playoffs. While for the Cougars and the Beavers, this is an important matchup to remain relevant on the college football landscape as they are the remaining remaining two schools in the Pac-12, and they are both looking for a conference or to rebuild the Pac-12 conference after next year. As it currently stands, they have the ability to keep the conference as it currently is through next year, after which they will have to have eight teams within the conference to remain a Power 5 conference. Make sure to leave your questions and opinions in the comments below, and we'll be looking to answer your questions on next week's podcast. And before we get into it, to stay up to date on all things Washington State University football, make sure to like and subscribe to the Couch GM. I am a WC grad as of 2016, and it's my goal to help share information on the teams that I care about the most. That is when I'm not working my full-time job as a mortgage broker here in the Pacific Northwest. So if you're looking to buy, sell, or refinance in Washington, Oregon, or Idaho, make sure to reach out to myself, the Couch GM, Connor Webb, and I'd be happy to help you with your mortgage financing needs. And with that, let's get into the podcast with Dylan Howe. All right, big week this week. It's rivalry week in the former Pac-12. We got two big rivalry games. We have the Apple Cup, which is happening this weekend against Washington State and the University of Washington Huskies. This is going to be on a neutral site at Lumen Field in Seattle. We also have the Civil War that is happening again this year versus you know Oregon and Oregon State. But first off, Dylan, you sent me a screenshot of a Reddit post, and it's showing the former Pac-12 schools this year. The group of teams are 21 and 2 and 3 and 0 against the SEC on the year. Imagine if the Pac 12 was still here, maybe they would be getting some recognition that they deserve, but instead, now it's just a weird mess of trying to find and figure out how to watch these games in in the Big 10, you know, with their separate separate subscription networks. You got the Big 12, you have the Pac 12. It's just a mess. What what are your thoughts on, you know, the conference realignment and what's going on? I mean, we saw last year, Pac-12 is arguably the best football conference in the nation. And, you know, this season, I saw a tweet uh, from Jeff O'Neill, big time Cougar fan. And he said, you know, it's like these 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 post-game recaps, Sports Center, this and that. I mean, hardly glossing over Oregon and Boise State. Hardly glossing over these new West Coast schools that are now uh, in the Midwest and, and East Coast time zones. You know, it's like this East Coast bias is still sticking. And it, it's hilarious. You, you saw Softy state, I just cut the cord on Comcast. I'm, I'm buying uh, YouTube TV. Well, Softy, six months ago, you were saying, hey, linear's the way. You know, so it's, it's just kind of funny seeing uh, some of these Huskies and Ducks fans with their uh, foot in their mouth. And we'll have to see how things shift moving forward. You know, the Pac-12, these two teams, Washington State and Oregon State, they have this year, next year, until they have to have eight teams in the conference. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a Power 5 conference. So there's some realignment that, realignment that has to happen. But yeah, the East, Co- the East Coast bias continues. We're still having to, you know, try to push out content for the West Coast teams because no one else is talking about them. So we'll keep doing our thing to try to get the word out there. Also from social media this week, a big shout out to Mike Evans of the Buccaneers. He was rocking the Clay Thompson basketball jersey, Washington State number one, heading into the game this week. As we transition into the Texas Tech uh, WSU portion, we have our Texas Tech butthurt fan of the week on X, and it is Mr. Ryan Evans. Ryan E836. It's wild that the most resource poor talent poor program in the p5 who literally got relegated out of the p4 is a better program than 110 million revenue program in texas well enjoy lubbock ryan i'm sure it's great this time of the year and a big shout out to texas tech for allowing john mentir to set the school record for rushing yards in a game by a quarterback with 197 rushing yards big shout out to you guys and tag him in this tag him in this let's, let's do a little recap of the washington state texas tech game it was a wild game. John Mateer ends up setting the single game record for WSU for a quarterback with 197 rushing yards. I mean, even is this guy even a quarterback at this point, or is he just an RB1 that's able to throw the ball as well? 
Oh, dude, that 62-yard rush, man, I mean, it was insane. He wouldn't go down. And he talked about it at the end of, you know, in his press conference. Man, I didn't want to get laughed at by my teammates. I didn't want to get caught. I mean, that is a big boy. Uh, most rushing yards just absolutely eclipsed Tim Rosenbach's record. And he was just insane. You know, I texted uh, Greg Witter, of Coug fan, during the game. I said, football is so weird, man. He said, I'm just, I was telling my brother the same thing. Because at the time, I, Mateer was two for nine, 17 yards, and WSU was up three scores. I mean, what a, what a, also uh, an intro to that game. I remember Coach Dickert was really talking up our kickoff specialist. And I'm sorry, I do not have his name at the moment. I'm sure you will dub in uh, his photo and uh, name as we're talking about this. But, you know, he said we brought him in specifically to kick off and just have touchbacks. Gene, Dean Janikowski focused on kicking. I mean, he booted touchbacks all week long against Portland State. First play of the game, Pooch, um, onside kick. We get it two plays later, John Mature interception. I'm like, gosh, we're, we're <laughs> Coogan. We're back. We're back, baby. That that opening was insane. I mean, it showed – I love to see the, the aggressiveness. You know, if it doesn't work out, I mean, they have decent field position, but the fact that it worked out. And then just, yeah, the entire first quarter of that game was just a sloppy mess from both sides, really. John Mature throws an interception the second play from the line of scrimmage. But then beyond that, it was really Washington State dominating across the line. The, the first game for, for WSU, John Mateer was 11 for 17, 352 yards with five touchdowns in the air. In this game, he was 9 for 19, 115 yards in the air, one touchdown, one interception. And then he had 21 carries, 197 yards, and a touchdown on the ground. So, I mean, this, this next game against UW is going to be their first real big test. And we're going to see what John Mateer is made of in this Apple Cup. Yeah. And, and, you know, hey, we didn't really throw the ball against Texas Tech. I mean, the over-under was at 66 points. You had Tech scoring 52 week one, us scoring 70, and it, it went under. 300 total yards of rushing, though. I mean, Sean Parker with another touchdown, John Mateer with a touchdown, you know, Javonski, Schlendelecker uh, coming in and, and, and getting getting a touchdown as well. So it's going to be interesting to, to see – how John Mateer looks uh, this week, because let's be honest, he looked a little rattled in that first half, a little nervous, you know, missed some, some wide open throws. Now in the second half too, you had guys drop some balls that John, you know, kind of put right on the numbers. So you're hoping, Hey, you know, nationally televised game, big one, big 12 conference school, first home game. Let's, let's see how Mateer, and his nerves look next week uh, at a neutral site uh, facility. And that kind of uh, takes us into the next aspect of, of the Apple Cup, you know, being at Lumen Field. And, and Connor, kind of kind of update us on, on what this ticket situation looks like. Yeah, so as far as ticket sales are concerned, apparently as of right now, we're co recording on the Monday leading up to the Apple Cup. Apparently ticket sales are somewhere around half sold at Lumen Field. There's a few reasons to this. First off, UW season ticket holders don't have a free ticket, or that's not a part of the package. Since it's a neutral site, they have to buy their own ticket at Lumen Field. Also, apparently, what what I've speculation is that Washington State fans are protesting them not being in a conference, so that could be playing into this a bit. But not a good look right now. If if it's going to be a nationally televised game this coming Saturday, twelve thirty. It's on Peacock. You know. Yeah. It's is it on streaming. Peacock? It's on Peacock. Yeah. So. You know, you don't want a half sold stadium on, on TV there. Uh, it's going to be a huge game. And I mean, we could talk about the ticket sales more, but then we'll get into the impl implications of what this game really means. Yeah. I mean, the implications, it's a totally different feel. I mean, typically, Apple Cup, right around Thanksgiving, it's usually kind of, you know, during the last three or four leech years, that game really kind of determined who was going to win the Pac 12 North. Um, so now, fast forward, Washington State, way different boat than UW. We got to rattle off an 11-1, 12-0 season. Took care of Texas Tech. Remaining two games, UW and Boise State. And then all of a sudden, like we said, we've got that Mountain West schedule up until that final you know, road game against Oregon State. Uh, so from our standpoint, from WSU standpoint, is this is a must-win game. It, it's, it's one of the last marquee games on the schedule from UW standpoint. Now, this is their last game before they have to get into their Big Ten schedule. I think they open up with Northwestern at home, and then they fly to Rutgers. Have fun in Piscataway, all right? 
Um, <laughs> ridiculous. So um, it, it, that's just kind of the tale of the differences in terms of, hey, this is the marquee game for, for WSU. You know, I, I figure tickets are going to pick up with WSU beating Texas Tech, but there is still a lot of, uh, of Cougs and renowned Cougs online that are against it and will be watching the game from home. So, you know, that just, that's what happens with these neutral site games. Continue the home and home, and, and, and that's, that, that's that snake oil salesman Pat Chun coming right in there. <laughs> he leaves Washington State, goes to UW. I mean, and you talk about the implications. Yeah, these are the biggest implications in this rivalry game that we've seen in both of these rivalry games that we've seen really in years. All four teams are undefeated heading into the Apple Cup and to the Civil War. And as you mentioned, you know, it's big for UW and Oregon because this is big for their playoff hopes. Um, if they were to lose one of these rivalry games, as you mentioned, now they have the, the full Big Ten schedule. That's going to be tough for them. And then with WSU and OSU, it's big implications, not just for this year, but for next year and for 2026. If they want to really keep themselves or put themselves back on the map, say like, hey, we just beat these you know, Big Ten teams. WSU just beat a Big 12 team handily at home. We need to be in the, these big conferences competing with these big teams because everyone knows that the talent is there and as Dickert said in his post game press conference after the Tech game, this is not a statement win. You w WC WCU has been doing this forever, as he said, and they deserve to be in a big conference. Yeah, I mean this is gonna be big time. We gotta have eyeballs on the TV set. Coop fans need to step up. We need to be able to watch this game. There's gonna be a lot of implications. Like we said, there's only four games that matter this year for us in terms of TV viewership um, and attendance, and it's gonna be the Oregon State. Um, Boise State, Texas Tech, and UW. Okay, so we're one out of four done. Took the dub against Texas Tech. Let's see, uh, you know how things turn out this week. And and you're and you're looking at a, a, a UW team that has to replenish a lot, and, and we have to replenish a lot on our defensive side of the football too. But I mean, they lose Michael Penix, they lose Polk, they lose Roma Dunze, they lost a lot. This is a new team. Uh, now there are still some 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 secrecies between WSU and UW, and one of them is Will Rogers, the transfer quarterback from Mississippi State. So let's go let's go back before Gardner Minshew was a quarterback. His offensive coordinator was Will Rogers' dad, Wyatt, at Brandon High in Mississippi. So that's where Gardner learned the air raid was through Will Rogers' father, Wyatt. Mike Leach takes off after the Minshew season, goes to Mississippi State, who's his start his first quarterback. It's Will Rogers. Obviously, tragedy, Mike Leach passes away. The defensive coordinator took over as the head coach, had a poor season, brought, you know, brought in a pro style offense as opposed to the air raid. And Rogers only played eight games, got hurt, then transferred to UW under Kalen DeBoer and Ben Grubb. Well, hey, they uh, decide. UW is the typical stepping stone program. You know, they're going to win there to get that better job. That happened once again. He takes the Alabama job. And all of a sudden, Will Rogers opens his recruitment back up. But Jed Fish gets hired. They had played Mississippi State when he was at Arizona last year. So he liked what he saw on the tape, was able to keep him. And, and Rogers has looked good uh, through his first two games. But it's Eastern Michigan and Weaver State. So this is going to be his first test as a UW quarterback and really the skill positions at UW. We're going to see what they have as well, you know, for the first time. So their game plan is going to be pretty simple. It's going to be run the ball and put pressure on John Materi. Expect a lot of blitz packages and and, and they're going to really try to make things tough for Materi, disguising coverages at the line. So it, it's going to be a real litmus test for John this week. Uh, you know, we thought it would happen this past week against a really undermanned Texas Tech secondary, which is a little concerning going into this week, but We'll see. Uh, we'll see what they can do in terms of uh, looking at last week's tape and and moving forward. A bit more on Will Rogers. You know, this is a highly touted quarterback in the transfer portal that was coming out of Mississippi State. He played 43 games over four seasons at Mississippi State, making 40 40 starts. He set a total of 29 single game season and career school records at Mississippi State. His 94 career touchdown passes ranked number four in SEC history while his career yardage total was number two. So th this is not just a, a small transfer that was coming to UW. This is a, a big-name quarterback that has the the history and the stats, kind of like a Bo Nix to where he has a ton of experience in college. Yeah. This year, so far, he's 41 of 52 
a 79% uh, completion percentage so far on the year, 511 yards, an average of 9.8, five touchdowns, no interceptions, a QB rating of 193.1. I mean, we think that this game will come down to who can stop the run, but they also have that weapon with, at quarterback that, that, that they can definitely utilize. And looking at the, the current stats, the leader, the rushing leader for UW is Jonah Coleman, 27 carries, 231 yards, three touchdowns. The leading rusher for WSU right now is John Matir, 252 yards on the ground, which is more than UW's leading rusher on the ground. So we'll have to see what happens. It's going to be a good game. It's going to be a big test for Will Rogers for this entire UW team, as well as the WC team. And it's going to be a completely different environment and an NFL stadium. You just really don't get that true college aspect you know so yeah it, it's gonna, it's gonna be interesting and how about the the potential injuries for wcu i know in the first half of the the wcu game there was a couple scares first kyle williams he was taken down by like three or four guys looks like all of that weight went onto his shoulder i thought he dislocated his shoulder or something like that he had to go to the locker room but then he comes back out right before the second half catches that hey. tip drill in the end zone for a touchdown and so he seems that he should be okay it was like kind of very Paul Pierce like, you know, like the <laughs> camera angle kind of zoomed in on Kyle. Hey, we're glad he was like oh. Kyle's okay. It looked like yeah. he was almost like in tears just because yeah. I think he might have thought, hey, my season's it's over. Like he's done. He, knows. he come back in, go in the locker room, figure out, okay, hey, we're okay. Comes back out and makes that incredible, like you said, touchdown catch in the corner where he kind of bobbled it, lost it, and then found it at the end. <laughs> so that was huge because we're we're already thin at wide receiver. And one of those designations is Carlos Hernandez. You know, I talked to uh, Jamie Vinnick, league beat writer of Coon Fan. Obviously, we're, we're taping this on a Monday, so the current press conference for Coach Dicker's happening right now as we speak. And, you know, he thinks Jamari Colson, started corner, going to most likely be out again this week as well as Carlos Hernandez. And the guy that filled in for Jamari, Ethan O'Connor, who we talked about last week, who was fantastic. Nine pass attempts against him, only one completion. He had an interception. He did a fantastic job last week, so he's going to be in the thick of it once again. Punter, Nick Harborer, he thinks it would be anywhere from a questionable standpoint. Obviously, Dean Janikowski has been hand in, handling the punting. Didn't look too bad punting the football. Unfortunately, he looked better punting the football than actually kicking. Uh, missed extra point as well as uh, a field goal last week. So yeah. that, that just goes to show you how, having to handle both of those duties, you know, it's 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 tough. So it would be great to have Nick back. And then – Fa'alili, Fa'amoe. Check the pronunciation. Dill's got it. Looks like it's going to be questionable, and, and that's arguably our best offensive lineman. So getting him back to add to Hillborn and Brock Duo is going to be huge. That's 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 where we have a you know a little bit of our age is on that offensive line, and you know if we can get a Fa'alili back, that's going to be huge going forward. And also a true freshman running back, Wayshawn Parker. He's been a stud so far this year. He he looked like he was limping a little bit in that game. Are there, is there like any word on, on his status? I haven't seen too much on that. Again, you know, we'll uh, we'll see what comes out of that press conference today. Not good. You know, obviously seeing him limp off near the end of that game. So uh, that's just kind of where we're at in terms of uh, the, the injury report this week for the Cougs. So kind of go from there. Yeah, so it'll be it'll be an interesting Apple Cup. It'll be a huge Apple Cup in bias not bias this is the the biggest opportunity that i think washington state has had in a few years to really take down the huskies last year when the huskies made it to the national championship game the cougs nearly pulled off an upset in, in the Apple cup yeah there was some stuff that that happened in that game the penalties right towards the end yeah that were, were questionable maybe you're trying to keep uh, the huskies um, yeah. huskies playoff hopes alive yeah cam ward just you know he runs the football on that third and 13 wide open 20, 30 yards. We were maybe kicking a, you know, an expiring field goal to win that game, but Hey, you know, but yeah, essentially UW's entire roster is turned over. I think it was a, an article in January to where there was something like 40 different members of, of UW's football team that either transferred, decommitted, retired. It's basically a completely different team. They're trying to learn. They're trying to get their chemistry in order. They're trying to figure things out. So it'll be a big game. Now, moving into the, to the civil war between Oregon and Oregon State, this is going to be another big matchup. We've seen Oregon nearly lose a couple games that they should not be losing close games. You know, the first one, University of Idaho nearly takes them out at Austin and Eugene. Second game against Boise State. Boise State. 
Boise State is a highly touted team this year with their their running back being a potential Heisman hopeful. What are your thoughts on on Oregon this year and then also Oregon State as we head into the Civil War? I mean, Oregon, $20 million NIL roster, baby, and and they're just squeaking <laughs> by. You know, I but they're getting dubs. And, and you take a look at this Oregon team could be similar to what the UW team was last year. Not a lot of people remember that. UW team had eight one-score victories. You know, leading up to that Final Four and national championship appearance. So, hey, they are they they haven't looked you know as vauntly as as we as we thought they would this season, but they're still two and zero. And, and this game, the Civil War, it's it, it reminds me of an old fable, the tortoise and the hare. So far through two weeks this year, Oregon State leads the nation in time of possession. Uh, that twenty one zero victory over San Diego State last week. I mean, it was just total utter line domination and rushing domination. They had the ball for thirty eight minutes as opposed to SDSU twenty one minutes and change. And they're led by a, another dynamic duo at running back. And and this year it's an old face, Jam Griffin and uh, Anthony Hankerson. Now Hankerson transferred from Colorado. He was there the past two seasons. Jam Griffin started his career at Georgia Tech then transferred to Oregon State in 2022, transferred out to Ole Miss and Lane Kiffin in 2023, only had seven rushing attempts. So he's back after Oregon State lost Damian Martinez to the whole NIL conundrum with with Miami. So they have a great two-pronged horse over there. And again, you know, if they can control the clock, they can use that home environment and research, it's going to be sold out. You know these Beaver fans are going to be jammed up because they have the same thoughts as us. And early, you know, preseason, a lot of people thought Oregon State was just a little bit further ahead than where WSU was and had a, a, a you know, more of a likely chance of maybe running an 11-win, 12-win season. 16-point underdogs at home. The, uh, the over-under is 50 on that. I don't know how you don't take Oregon State in the points at home this weekend. 16 with how Oregon has, has looked. So it's going to be interesting to see Dylan Gabriel, you know, the big-time transfer quarterback uh, coming in from Oklahoma. He just has not looked great. Uh, you know, some missed throws last week against uh, Boise State. And then the other aspect is Oregon State's transfer quarterback is uh, Giovanni McCoy. He played his football under Coach Eck in Idaho last season. So, you know, what they're really relying on him to do, 9 for 10 first week against Idaho State, 15 for 25, 160 yards against San Diego State. He's just your game manager. You know, I, it's similar to what Jimmy G was with, with the 49ers. Don't make any critical mistakes. Let our rushing and our defense handle the handle the game and, and time of possession. And, and we're really just going to try and hold on to that football and not make any mistakes. So, my opinion, no bias. I'm taking the points in Oregon State this week. Yeah, and Dylan Gabriel on the year, he is 59 of 70, 623 yards in the air, four touchdowns. Giovanni McCoy for Oregon State is 25 of 36, 295 yards and two touchdowns. Jordan James for the Ducks is the leading rusher on the team. 32 carries, 197 yards and one touchdown. And then Jam Griffin is Oregon State's leading rusher. 38 carries, 249 yards and three touchdowns. As you mentioned, the the current line is is Oregon by 16 and a half. As far as the the UW Apple Cup game is concerned, right now Washington is favored four and a half points. So uh, that opened yeah. at eight and a half. Um, so that's that's almost it opened at eight and a half. In, yeah, almost chopped in half over the last 24 hours. Did that so. change? Oh, that changed over the last 24 yeah. hours. Yeah. So uh, interesting lines. Um, you know, I got a friend that's probably going to take WSU with the points this week. You know, so I'll. Uh, We'll see what he says about it. You might have two of those. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be an awesome week. Make sure to like and subscribe to the Couch GM to stay up to date on all things Washington State football moving forward. And we'll see you on the recap.